Good evening. I am really delighted to be here and to thank, uh, just like my sister, uh, Mrs. Saraki did, to thank um, Tikwe for extending this invitation to me. When he did, a couple of months back, I really didn't give my word to, but uh, he kept insisting that it would be a good idea for a diasporan, so to speak, who lived out here in the UK for a considerable length of time, went back home into politics to reflect on being an accidental politician and to also talk about transition from activism to partisan politics. Um, well, for whatever it's worth, I said, okay, I will try depending on what the uh, engagement back at home uh, really uh, is at the time. The reason why I am here particularly is to try and address this pseudo dichotomy that is put between activists and politicians and the impression that is often created that you automatically must move from one to the other uh, in order to uh, make a difference. I often get asked by many people, why would anyone with a relatively secure job and a pretty predictable lifestyle, good family, a mortgage, a decent, secure environment, would want to leave the comfort zone of living in the United Kingdom and return to Nigeria. Even worse, return to that most nasty, most brutish, most dangerous of vocation, politics. And I've often responded to people who ask me the question that I have never nursed a death wish. As a matter of fact, I love to celebrate life, just as many activists do. It was precisely the indignities of living in an undemocratic setting, struggling against military rule, also organizing from exile that eventually landed me in partisan politics. So in other words, my being in politics today is an extension of my life as an activist. And that's not something that started accidentally. I grew up in a home where I was made to believe it was important for me to be conscious of my environment. My father was a press officer in the civil service. So daily in my home, there were at, at the very least five, six newspapers that would lie on the, day on, 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 on the dining table, and I had no choice as a young man. From about the age of five, I started reading newspapers, uh, mostly unintelligible to me at the time, but I grew up recognizing the importance of really understanding what was going on around me. Inevitably, I became an activist as a student union uh, executive in the university and also became a journalist afterwards. The thing about being a journalist, particularly being a political journalist, is that you cannot be detached from what is happening around you. You have to have nursed a certain level of commitment to change in society to want to write about it. Yes, there are people who would tell you that you can maintain a certain detachment, a certain objectivity about what you were writing, uh, but that's not 
been my experience. I came into I came to the UK, UK not as an exile. I came here to study. I came here to take a PhD, and I successfully did that. By 1993, I think I was done uh, from King's College here in the University of London. And looking at the vials, I noticed that uh, 22 was there. So I guess you have a lot of uh, people who pass through that portal who end up in activism of some sort, uh, led by Bishop Desmond Tutu, uh, who was also there. But when I was there, I also wasn't particularly drawn into becoming uh, a Nigerian activist, so to speak. But I was there around the time the collapse of the Eastern Europe. The Cold War was just coming to an end, and there was a lot of things happening, which, of course, anyone from Africa at the time would naturally be drawn towards understanding how these things were happening, how ordinary people could resist the intimidating authoritarian powers that uh, were in charge of this state at the time. But I was also drawn particularly here to uh, local activism. Many of us, we know the story of inner city dwellings. I was living in one of the high rise towers uh, in South London, one of the really horrible ones in New Cross called Milton Court Estate. And in Milton Court Estate, it was largely a drug den at the time. It was uh, a no-go area. The tenants on the estate ended up electing me as the chair of the Tenants and Residents uh, Association. And in that capacity, we worked hard to change the entire uh, uh, living conditions on that estate. I haven't been there recently, but uh, by the time I left, the high rises, I think we had about seven then, four of them had come down, uh, demolished, and um, uh, much better accommodation was provided for uh, the residents in the, in, in the uh, estate. But that extended beyond that. I then became a local political activist. I was a member of the Deptford Lucian CLP uh, of the Labour Party. Uh, and that also afforded me an opportunity to really work at close quarters on community organizing. So when the elections in Nigeria were annulled in 93 by the military dictatorship, some of us felt this was really not something acceptable to us. We may be outside the country, but we had a duty, we had a role to be involved in the struggle to change what was going on at home. And many of us uh, formed ourselves into a group known here in the UK then as the New Nigeria Forum. It became the leading uh, civil society voice for resistance against the military oppression back in Nigeria. Of course, that struggle ended with the death of Abacha in uh, 1997, and unfortunately, the death of Abiola the following uh, month after Abacha died. Eventually, we ended up with what many of us have described as civilian rule. Uh, we're very hesitant to call what was going on then as democratic rule. But in spite of that, there was progress. Constitutional democracy was emerging, and rights were being returned uh, to uh, the country. It became obvious to me, even though I played critical behind the scene role in the civilian era that no matter what you do as an activist, when it comes to fundamentally transforming societies, particularly societies that have been 
under the residue of authoritarianism for a long time, you might also have very little choice than to become actively involved in partisan politics. So I was drawn into partisan politics. I was invited to come and run for office. That was about eight, nine years after I got back to Nigeria. And it was tough. I first had to cope with the level of being the Tokumba politician. Uh, Nigerians there will know what that means. Uh, the one from abroad, even though I grew up in uh, Nigeria before coming over here, I was seen as an outsider coming in, trying to uh, make a difference where others had failed in the past. And I was also not seen as a machine politician who could do things that politicians would normally do. I was seen as the activist in politics, you know, high-minded, principled, dogmatic, not opportunistic, not Janus-faced, not desperate. And these were things that immediately created the impression that, look, you're not going to survive here. Forget it, you won't make a difference, you will not uh, uh, succeed. But that started to change when I won the primaries in my party. And at the time, my party was seen as the party, clearly, that would win the election in my state, uh, even though it was an opposition party. It wasn't uh, uh, the ruling party in Nigeria uh, at the time. This was 2007. I won the election, but the electoral body said I did not win the election. It was obvious, pretty obvious to most discerning objective observers that I won the election. But I was also lucky. Another benefit of having lived out here, my election was probably the most covered election internationally. On the day of my election, New York Times was in my state. Uh, the Independent of London was there. BBC was there. So, a lot of what transpired was recorded by the international media and, uh, of course, made known widely. So when I got to court, it was another tough battle. Altogether, I spent three and a half years in court. And in that period, I was in the lower court, the trial court, twice. I ran my election twice. I was in the Court of Appeal twice before I was eventually declared the winner of that election about a year ago. Now, what lessons do I want to draw? An audience like this, full of people who are probably thinking, I would like to go to Nigeria, or for that matter to any other part of Africa. I would love to make a difference. I would love to share the knowledge that I've gained living outside. And I don't want to be a politician because politicians are supposed to be bad people, particularly in Africa. The first thing I would say is that dump the artificial divide between activism and politics, because the very things that you're fighting for as an activist, if you're a development activist or you are a social justice activist, these are also the things that people who are serious about seeing politics as a game changer rather than as a business are also fighting for when they manage to gain power. Two, I would say that there is never a perfect moment for anyone to make such a transition. But before I say that, I would also say, you don't even have to make that transition in order for you to be influential. Not everybody is going to become a politician. And I think the discussion, really, in a forum like this, should be about leadership. Leadership that is empowering 
leadership that improves citizens' engagement rather than a positional cost for personal aggrandizement. If it's about that, then I am not sure that is what you really want to do because you can make it in whatever field you're in without necessarily being in politics. And, but the critical thing why it's important to have decent, honorable people who have core values that guide them in whatever they do in politics is because they're going to carry those core values into whatever they're doing also in politics. And there are so many myths that people are going to give you about politics, particularly in a country like Nigeria. They will tell you that there's no way you can be a politician in such a setting without uh, having godfathers. The notion of godfather is this person who is all-knowing, all-seeing, omnipotent, and keeps paving the way for you in order to succeed. That is not necessarily true. And I'm not suggesting that you're not going to have people you can look up to, mentors in politics, but it's not in and of itself enough for you to get position in, in office. Two, I, I, I also think for diasporans, it is not, not automatic to return in order to be influential. I think that point has to be made very, very firmly. There are so many of us who feel that we just have to be there, join the Joneses in order to make a difference in politics. Many are already celebrated in, in their fields. And many serious-minded politicians are always looking out for people who can assist them in the quest for making a difference in the lives of their people. And the reason why being an activist helps in politics is that those things that you have fought for, as I said, are also the things that you are likely to push for when you are in office. And if you look at AKT State, a state of 2.5 million people, one of the smallest in Nigeria, the strides we've made in the last one year cannot be disconnected from the fact that I was once on the barricade and I understood what the people were dealing with. So when I came in, it was the first state to have a freedom of information law. Open the books to people. Let everybody become involved in what's going on and ensure that inclusiveness is the defining characteristics of governance. Public procurement law. Yesterday, I signed a historic bill into law before I left Nigeria, before I left Ekiti to mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. I signed a gender-based violence prohibition law. And that also is informed by the fact that I know what the ordinary people go through. I know the scourge that domestic violence has become in our society, which is basically largely kept under wraps. And if you don't have a vehicle out there mostly public, uh, uh, high-profile people in public, it would be difficult for us to combat this. And that informed many of the things that we've been doing in Ekiti. Of course, I lived out here. When I put in place the first social security benefit for the elderly in Nigeria, and probably in the whole of West Africa, it was informed by the fact that I've seen the benefits of social security support out here. And I've also looked at who exactly could benefit from this uh, in Nigeria uh, that are the most vulnerable in our society. So I pegged it at people of 65 and above who are indigent and are not already on pension uh, from an astral employment before retirement. And everybody commended the act. Everybody is trying to also do this, particularly my, my, my brother governors in, in their own states. So I think there is a benefit to take from being out there 
that can be infused into going back to wherever you come from in Africa, provided you stick to your core values, and provided you are also prepared not to let the perfect become the enemy of the good, because there is not a perfect period that any one of us can become actively engaged in our own societies. But citizens' engagement is really the primary and the core value that must be pushed by all of us, not artificial division between whether you are an activist or you are a politician. Because in the real sense of it, and at the end of the day, politics properly construed is really social activism. And this is how I would love all of us to see it. Thank you very much.